Thanks everyone for coming today. I'm going to talk a little bit about Jews uh, in Tafsir. Uh, so Tafsir being Quranic commentary uh, or exegesis. Um, and this is what I'm currently working on uh, in my PhD. So let's start with Little Red Riding Hood, a very relevant uh, topic, I know. Um, it's not coming up on this screen, so I'll just step forward so I can see uh, uh, here. Uh, so a little recap uh, of the story. There's a little girl who uh, is told by her mother to deliver food uh, to her grandmother, and her mother says, you must stay on path. Don't, don't, don't stray, you know, there's, there's bad things out there. There's a stalking wolf who sees an opportunity um, and uh, he uh, stalks Little Red Riding Hood, eventually eats the grandmother and disguises. Um, and uh, Little Red Riding Hood does not recognize her grandmother. Uh, eventually, um, she approaches the wolf, he eats, the woodcutter comes in and uh, opens the wolf's stomach and saves them, uh, both uh, Little Red Riding Hood and uh, the grandmother. So why am I mentioning this story? Well, there's a reason why we tell these stories, whether it's to children or to adults, um, and the reason is uh, for the lessons that they, they, uh, they have. There are exemplars, and there are what I've termed uh, non-exemplars, uh, which I don't know if it's the exact uh, perfect uh, turn of phrase, but the exemplars here are Little Red Riding Hood. She's doing a noble act. She's going out of her way to uh, help her, her grandmother. Uh, the mother is also an exemplar, sending her daughter, advising her, telling her to stay on task. The woodcutter is, is saving uh, them both. He's also an exemplar. There's not exemplars, of course. The wolf, uh, you don't want to be that individual who's preying on people. So in, in essence, really, these stories uh, often have a didactic form to them. There's something really that we must learn from them, uh, what to do and what not to do. In essence, who to emulate, who not to emulate. So if we look at the Qur'an, for example, if we approach it from this literary lens of what's really trying to be informed, or what's being told to the audience in terms of lessons, um, then it becomes interesting. Let's look at the characters in the Qur'an. Who are the characters in the Qur'an? Um, I mean, there are obviously many, many different characters from very ancient ones to Pharaoh to the contemporary Jews who are living with the Prophet Muhammad uh, in Medina. Who explains the Qur'an? The Qur'an is not a static book. The Qur'an, of course, uh, is explained by Qur'anic commentators uh, for centuries after uh, the Prophet Muhammad uh, to this day, until, you know, until now. Uh, so who are the exemplars and the non-exemplars within the Qur'an and within the tafsir, so the explanation of the Qur'an, in order that we as, you know, uh, or the Muslim audience may be able to know who to emulate, who not to emulate, who are the exemplars and who are the non-exemplars. Now, most Jews, of course, um, didn't accept Islam, but there were a small proportion who did in Medina, but most Jews uh, didn't. And so oftentimes, uh, the Qur'an will use Jews as non-exemplars, in essence, what not to do. And there's a reason for this. First, I'll give you a nice example. Um, so, Qur'an 2.6, uh, reads, Inna ladina kafaru, that those who disbelieve, the word kufr is important, it is the same whether you warn them or warn them not, they will not believe. So it's quite a, a generic statement, uh, perhaps it could be referring to any, any group of people. Um, and uh, so the first uh, exegete, Mubatil, says that those who disbelieve in these verses of Allah are this group of people, the name of Huyayi, Juday, um, and in essence, he's saying that this is in reference to a certain group of Jews that live in Medina. Tabari, who is a very famous Qur'anic commentator, says the same thing, uh, but expands upon it a little bit more. He says that it's the rabbis in Medina who are concealing the prophethood of Muhammad. They are the ones who are being referenced in this verse, those as disbelievers. Ibn Kathir repeats a similar type of thing, building on it more, saying it's about concealing the truth and confounding it with falsehood. Uh, and in essence, um, that, that, that the Jews in Medina were not revealing the truth and making it clear. So, which themes? Not, not, there's not just disbelief. There are many different themes that are involved um, uh, in relation to Jews within the tafsir. That, you know, hypocrisy, concealing the truth, arrogance, distortion, wrath, and corruption. One might think, well, why are these themes there? Why are they in relation to Jews at all? Well, actually, it's sort of quite simple in a way. Um, Jews of, are, of course, not the only non-exemplar within, within the tafsir world, uh, but they are recipients of divine revelation. Muslims are also recipients of divine revelation, according to the Quranic worldview. So it's almost like it's a warning for Muslims. You know, hypocrisy is only really a characteristic if 
You have faith. Faith is a prerequisite to hypocrisy. Concealing the truth. Well, truth is then a prerequisite to concealing the truth. And so all of the criticisms that are, that are directed against Jews are actually very relevant to a Muslim audience. And then you can see the didactic element. How the Quran and the Tafsir are basically trying to educate the Muslim audience in what not to do and what to do. And so that, I think, uh, really explains the role of Jews uh, within the Quran and Tafsir. So don't be a woodcutter, kill not the wolf, support the wolf. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>